After making the STM32 video about how to use I squared C, the biggest request I got was to do the same thing but for SPY. Well, this is it, how to use SPY with STM32. Once again, I'll be sticking to using the HAL API along with the STM32 Cube IDE, as both of those together offer a relatively easy way to get SPY up and running. SPY, or Serial Peripheral Interface, is a synchronous communication protocol developed by Motorola in the 1980s. It's a de facto standard, meaning there's no formal standard for it. As a result, you'll run into lots of variations in naming and implementations from different companies. SPY is implemented with one controller or master device that initiates all communication. It requires one clock line, separate data out and data in lines, and a chip select line. Sometimes you'll see these pins with different names or acronyms such as clock or serial clock. Data coming out of a device might be labeled with SDO for serial data out, which should be connected to the serial data in or SDI pin of other devices. For data coming out of the controller, you'll also often see master out slave in or controller out peripheral in. For data going into the controller, you'll see master in slave out or controller in peripheral out. Finally, the chip select or CS pin can sometimes be labeled as SS for slave select. Note that SPY is normally full duplex as it has separate transmit and receive lines, which means you can transmit and receive at the same time. Every now and then, you'll come across a device that tries to save on pins, so it will implement a half duplex version of SPY, so you cannot transmit and receive simultaneously. In that case, you'll need to connect the devices as follows. For most STM32 parts, the SDO or MOSI pin is used as the shared input-output pin when SPY is configured for half-duplex mode. We won't go into that here though. One of the big advantages of SPY is that it is a bus, meaning you can have multiple peripherals for each controller device. All of the lines are shared except for the chip select line. You will need to dedicate one pin on your controller for each peripheral you wish to communicate with. Notice that the chip select lines are active low, so by default, all of your chip select lines are high. When you want to talk to one of the peripherals, you pull the chip select line connected to that peripheral low. Sometimes, you'll come across parts that work in a daisy chain configuration. This is popular with things like SPY LED drivers. Here, the clock and chip select lines are shared among all the peripherals. Data out from the controller goes to the first peripheral. Then, data out from the first peripheral goes to the data in line on the second peripheral. This can continue for any number of peripheral devices. On the last peripheral, data out is connected back to the data in pin on the controller. Here is a simple timing diagram of what SPY communication looks like. To start, you pull the chip select line low and then the controller begins to pulse the clock line with data going out and coming in simultaneously on the MOSI and MISO lines. However, because SPY is not an official standard, things start to get a little complicated. You sometimes see two versions of the clock, one that idles low and another that idles high. The clock polarity or C-pole parameter determines this. The other parameter is the clock phase, or CPHA. When CPHA is zero, it means that bits on the MISO and MOSI lines should be sampled on the leading edge of the clock pulse. If C-pole is zero, that means on the rising edge, and if C-pole is one, it's on the falling edge. Additionally, you can have CPHA be one, in which case bits are sampled on the trailing clock edge. These two parameters can make SPY quite confusing, but they do make it more flexible as you're able to choose how the clock line operates and when to sample data bits. Rather than clock polarity and clock phase parameters, you will sometimes just see a mode parameter. There are four possible modes, and they correspond to the four possible configurations of the polarity and phase parameters. In practice, you will almost always use mode zero, as this is what most peripheral devices support. In this mode, clock polarity and phase are both set to zero, meaning the clock is default low and you sample on the rising edge. Here is an actual spy signal that I captured on my logic analyzer. In it, I'm asking the EEPROM chip that we will use in our demo to return the value in its status register. The controller begins communication with the peripheral by pulling the chip select line low. Then, on each clock pulse, it sends out data on the MOSI line. 
Because this is mode zero, the clock idles low and data is sampled on the leading edge. As a result, we get five for the first byte on the MOSI line and zero on the MISO line. This is the read status register command for our EEPROM chip. While SPI is full duplex and the peripheral could transmit data back to the controller, this particular device does not behave like that. It wants you to transmit data first and then read second. On the next byte, we do not send out anything from our controller. Instead, we simply read the MISO line. Here, the EEPROM is telling us that the value in its status register is 2. When we're done transmitting, we pull the CS line connected to our EEPROM chip back to high. This is a very simple communication example, but I hope it gives you an idea of how SPI works. A question you'll often hear is, what's the maximum speed for SPI? Because SPI is synchronous, which means it has a separate clock line, theoretically it can run at any speed. However, you'll often run into limitations based on the speeds of your individual parts and any signal integrity issues you might have due to line length and their proximity to other signals. It's often a good idea to look at all of your data sheets in your project and figure out the maximum SPI speeds for them and go with whatever is the lowest. For my purposes, I usually find that speeds in the range of 1 to 10 megabits per second work fine for most of my needs. For this demo, I'm going to use this simple 4 kilobit EEPROM from Microchip. I know that most modern microcontrollers have built-in EEPROM, but external EEPROM chips like this one are cheap and they're good for showing spy operation. Notice that the maximum clock speed of this chip is 10 megahertz. Also, we'll need to hold the active low write protect and hold pins high. We can wire up the rest of the pins as a normal spy point-to-point -point device with our Nucleo board. If we look at the timing diagrams, we can see that the bits are sampled on the rising clock edge, indicating that modes 0 or 3 will work. Since mode 0 is the most common, we'll stick with that. Scroll down and you'll see the supported instructions. While we can use 9 bits to access memory addresses, we'll stick to 8 bits for our example to make things easier. We'll want to first set the write enable latch. Then we can perform a page write sequence where we send the write instruction followed by the starting address in memory. From there, we can write up to 16 bytes in succession, which will be stored to the EEPROM. The write enable latch is automatically reset after our write instruction. To read those bytes back, we first need to read the status register and see if the write in progress bit is set. We keep reading that bit until it clears, which means the write operation has completed. From there, we can perform a read page sequence just like we did with the write operation. We'll send out the read instruction followed by the starting address. The EEPROM chip will send us the values in its memory in successive bytes over its serial outline as long as we keep toggling the clock line. All we need to do is read those bytes and compare them to what we wrote. If they match, we can say that our SPI communication and EEPROM chip work. Here is how we'll connect the EEPROM chip to our Nucleo board. The SPI pins on the Nucleo should be labeled and easy to use. Note that you can use any GPIO pin for your chip select line. While you can have the hardware automatically control the chip select line, I'm going to show you how to do it manually with a GPIO pin, which makes it easier to use with multiple peripheral devices. I'll be using an STM32 Nucleo L476RG for this demo, but almost any Nucleo board should work. Because we're working with the microcontroller directly, we need to know the pin names connected to the board headers. I find that the embed site for the Nucleo boards offer the best pinout diagrams. We can see that we should use PA567 and PB6 for our SPI pins. Notice that we need to use the SPI1 peripheral. In STM32 Cube IDE, start a new STM32 project. Select your board, which is the Nucleo L476RG for me. Give your project a memorable name and open the CubeMX perspective. I told CubeMX to initialize all of the peripherals in their default states for the board, which means we get access to UART and an LED. However, that LED is connected to D13 on the board, which is shared with our SPI clock line, so we need to disable it. In connectivity, click on SPI1. Set the mode as full duplex master. 
We can have the STM32 hardware control the chip select line, but we'll leave that feature disabled. In configuration, leave the format as Motorola and change the data size to 8 bits, as our EEPROM chip communicates in 1 byte chunks. Leave the first bit as MSB as the EEPROM expects the most significant bit to arrive first. 40 megabits per second is too fast for our EEPROM, so let's adjust the prescaler to slow it down. I'm going to take it to about 1 megabits per second since I'm working with jumper wires on a breadboard, which can make signal integrity very sketchy. A clock polarity of low is the same as zero, and a phase of one edge refers to the leading edge, which is also zero from our table, so we'll leave these settings alone. I don't think it matters as we're not using a hardware chip select line, but I like to disable the NSS pulse mode, which from what I could gather, brings the chip select line back to high between data bursts. Finally, because we plan to adjust the chip select line manually, we need to set its mode to GPIO output. If you remember, it's PB6 from our pinout diagram. Save to generate code and open main.c. To begin, we need to include the standard input-output header file as we need it for sprintf. Then I'll create a number of constants that represent the available instructions we can send to the EEPROM chip. In main, I'll then declare some variables. The UART buffer is needed to store strings that we want to print out to our serial terminal. We'll also need a spy buffer to send and receive spy data. After configuring our peripherals, we should make sure that our chip select pin is driven high. I'll then print something out to the serial terminal to make sure everything is working. To write something to EEPROM, we first need to send the write enable command. To do that, I'll pull the chip select line low, send out the write enable command, and then pull the chip select line back high. The HAL spy transmit function requires us to pass it a handle to our spy configuration and cast the data we wish to send to an 8-bit unsigned integer pointer. Finally, we tell it how many bytes we wish to send, one in this case, and give it a timeout. You can use HAL max delay, but I like to keep the timeout period shorter, like 100 milliseconds. Note that I really should be checking the return status of each spy function, as I did in the I squared C episode, but that creates more code than I want to show here. Remember the logic analyzer screen capture we looked at? This next command shows how I generated that diagram. We pull the chip select line low, send out the read status register command, and then we call the spy receive function, which works like the transmit function. The difference here is that we give it a pointer to a buffer, which will be filled with the red bytes. The third parameter is the number of bytes we wish to read, which is only one in this case. Finally, we print the contents of the status register to the serial terminal. Let's build the project and start debugging. I'll use PuTTY to connect to my Nucleo board. Click the play button and you should see some info show up in the serial terminal. Because we sent the write enable command first, the write enable latch bit should be set in the status register, giving us a value of 2. I hope this gives you a basic idea of how to use SPY with STM32HAL. Just to show you how you might want to interact with that EEPROM chip, I wrote some extra code as a demonstration. I'll fill the first three bytes of the SPY buffer with the data I want to write to the EEPROM and set the starting address to 5. Next, I'll send the write command followed by the starting address, and then I'll send over all three data bytes sequentially. I'll clear the buffer after that. Because EEPROM can sometimes take a while to write, we need to wait for the write-in-progress bit to be cleared in the status register before doing anything else with it. So we read the status register and check the value of the WIP bit. We loop doing that so long as that bit is 1. In retrospect, a do-while loop would have made more sense here. Oh well. Once we're sure that the EEPROM is done writing, we can read those three bytes back. Note that I'm using the receive function here after sending the read command followed by the same starting address. After that, we print those three bytes out to the serial terminal. I'll read the status register again to show how the write enable bit automatically clears itself after a successful write. Let's debug and bring up the serial terminal again. We should see A, B, C, D, E, F printed to the console. Notice that the status register in the EEPROM chip starts at 2 when we first send it the write enable command and then clears to 0 when we're done writing. 
Because these spy functions are blocking, your code will do nothing waiting for everything to finish transmitting or receiving. I'm going to show you one way to make it non-blocking. If you look at the HAL API documentation for the L4 series, you can see that there are interrupt-based functions we can use. These are the ones that end in underscore IT. When the transmit underscore IT function completes, it will call the TX complete callback function, which we need to implement in our code. The same thing is true for the receive underscore IT function and the RX complete callback function. You can click on these to jump to the full function description to see what parameters are required. Rather than go piece by piece, I'm going to give you a broad overview of the code. A link to all the code in this episode will be provided in the description if you'd like to dig into it. To use the interrupt-based spy functions, we need to go back into the CubeMX software and open our spy configuration. In NVIC settings, enable the global interrupt for your spy controller. Without this, interrupts won't work for spy. Save and regenerate code. In main, our includes and eeprom instructions look the same. I added a couple of global flags here that we'll use from within the interrupt callbacks. Note the volatile keyword. This is necessary when changing variables in your main thread and in interrupt service routines. Without it, the compiler might think you're not using the variable and optimize it away. We're going to use a finite state machine to perform the reading and writing over spy, so I need a state variable. Setup is the same as before. We write something to the serial terminal and set our eeprom starting address. My state machine starts with case 0. Here, we fill the buffer with the write command, starting address, and then 10 bytes of data we wish to store. I'll just make it sequentially count from 0 to 9. Like before, we first send the write enable command using the blocking spy write as it's only one byte. Then, we do something a little different for the non-blocking write. We pull the chip select line low and send out all 12 bytes of data, including the command and address, using the transmit underscore IT command. I need to leave the chip select line low until it's done, so I just increment the state and leave. In the next state, I do nothing while waiting for the transmit flag to be set. Because this is part of a state machine, the main while loop will be called over and over, which means you can still implement your code after this switch case statement. Your code will run while waiting for the long spy transmit sequence to complete. Interrupts will occur in the background to send out spy bytes as needed. The transmit flag gets set in the TXComplete callback function, which I will show you in a minute. Once we get that flag, we immediately clear it and go to the next state. Here, we read the write in progress bit from the status register. We continually do that and only go to the next state once it's cleared. We then set up to read 10 bytes from the eeprom starting at our given address. Like before, we use the receive underscore IT function to read bytes in interrupt mode. Once again, I do not pull the chip select line high. In the next state, we wait for the receive flag this time. Once we get it, we clear the flag and go to the final state. In that, we simply print out the bytes that we received followed by a new line character. I'll add a delay here to make this happen more slowly. Yes, I know it's bad practice to use a blocking delay in non-blocking code, but this is just a demo. We'll set the state to zero and start over. Don't forget to make a default state just in case something really goes wrong. We'll implement our interrupt service routine callbacks at the bottom of our main.c. When transmitting is done, we pull the chip select line high and set the transmit flag. We do the same thing in the receive callback, but using the receive flag instead. These will get called automatically whenever transmitting or receiving is done. Let's compile and run our program. When we look at the serial terminal, we should see our 10 bytes being printed to the console. This tells us that we're successfully reading and writing to the eeprom chip. I hope this helps you get started using Spy in your own projects and gives you some ideas on how to make your code non-blocking. Please subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one, and happy hacking!